Um, so today's speaker is Timothy Papandreou. Uh, Timothy has been an original and innovative thinker about urban transportation for as long as I've known him, which is now getting to be a decent amount of fun. Given that statement, he is, of course, a graduate of the UCLA Urban Transportation. <laughs> Uh, and he was at LA Metro before making a move to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he co-founded, now, now, now. He co-founded City Innovate, which is a smart city platform that helps create win-win solutions for cities, startups, and established companies. And until recently, was the strategic partnerships manager at Google X and Waymo, where he helped to prepare the launch of the first world, uh, world's first self-driving ride service. And before that, Timothy was the Chief Innovation Officer at the San Francisco MTA, uh, where he helped deliver the, uh, a team that delivered the US Smart City Challenge, their strategic work plan, achievement of the 50% uh, sustainable mode share goal three years early. I think that's where yeah. right there. Um, and the city's Vision Zero Traffic Safety Program. Uh, Timothy's impressive track record in transition innovation, partnership building, and forward thinking to my mind, make him a perfect final speaker in this spring's transportation lecture series. And I would like you to join me in welcoming Timothy Papandreou back to you soon. Hi, everybody. So great to be back. Um, I think I was actually in one of these rooms. I remember the, actually, I do remember being in these rooms where it was really sunny and the, the constantly darked out. So it uh, <laughs> brings back some memories. It's amazing how many things have changed inside the building and how many things have not changed at all. Um, like the restrooms have not changed at all. So, uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, the people have changed, the faces have changed, but the, the, the walls are still there, which is yeah, great. Yeah, unfortunately the restrooms now, because of their age, their historical landmarks. And you can't touch them. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, there's no sensors. I had to like pull things myself. And like, yeah. So I was like, interesting. Um, anywho, um, it's also interesting to see that there's a bird scooter in the hallway, so yes. that's a really interesting um, uh, situation that we're having right now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just what's happened uh, over the last few years in transportation and, and where we're going. And uh, as Brian said, I've had a pretty interesting uh, career where I've got to be always at the cutting edge or before the cutting edge on a lot of things, and I get to see things, join the dots, get it up and running, launch it, and then I go. So I'm not the one that likes to stay out and do the full scale implementation, I like to get it ready and then head off. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a continuous process like that, and it's really great because you get to learn all this cool stuff, you get to move around a lot, you get to talk to a bunch of different interesting people, but the most amazing thing is you have very different perspectives of what you uh, think is what we should do, and then you realize what we can do, and then you figure out how we actually can actually do it. Um, so there's a bit of, humility, humbleness, brevity, and uh, maturity that comes with doing a lot of different things and in a lot of different places and gives you a lot of perspective. Um, I'm going to just start off by saying, you know, our world is radically changing. Um, and it's been changing for a while now. And so we're moving towards a city planet. And our planet of cities have got a lot of differences amongst them, but the commonality is all of us. We're basically part of this, this ecosystem. It's a brand new organism, didn't really exist before, and we've, we've created it from basically uh, the things around us. And these cities are talking to each other many, many more ways than they used to in the past. They're much more connected, they're much more competitive, and they're much more interactive. And what that means is that your traditional boundaries of what you consider your place, your space, and your, your uh, domain are radically changing. And whether that's through telecommunications or technology or just through the sheer force of, of, of our mass migration, we've never had this many people in the world move around this much. And we're going to have 10 times more people moving around in the next decade. Most of you may not be working in the United States in the next 15 years. That's just a, a fact. And so. And whether you're physically not working in the United States or you're, you're, you're uh, virtually working in for other, other organizations around the world, that's becoming more, of a, a more of, a, of a fact. So all of these things are radically going to be changing how we, we get around and how we think about things. Having said that, more than two-thirds of the population will be living in cities in the next uh, couple of decades. We've already hit the, tip, the halfway point. We're heading really rapidly towards three-quarters uh, before the end of the mid-century. And so... This is going to be creating profound changes in how we, we live in our cities. 
And in the world that I think we all care about, which is movement of people and things, that's being flipped on its head. And so um, a lot of the presentation I'll talk about today is about where we're heading, where we're, what we need to do, and how do we prepare for it as we move forward. As Brian said, the reason why I developed uh, City Innovate Foundation is because I've been on, the, I've been on both sides of the, the coin. I've been on the public sector side and I've been on the private sector side for many years. And uh, it's, it's concerning to me how much preparation is required from the public sector side to be able to even engage in where the technology is coming from. Just having an uh, honest conversation uh, with uh, the scooter uh, companies right now Cities just aren't prepared to have those conversations. So the whole point of the City of Innovate Foundation is to be that bridge to, to do that. So a lot of this, your classes have already talked about, so I can run through most of this, but we have a binary policy system in transportation that just doesn't work anymore. You know, we have two, two systems. One is the privately owned, use your own car, use it for everything model. And then if you're lucky in some cities, because remember, take the U.S. context out, most cities don't have a good public transit system um, anyway. If you have a bus system, it's really hard to use and doesn't really get you where you want to get to. So that's our binary system that we have right now. And our, all of our policies, whether it's subsidies, whether it's laws or taxes, whatever it is, have all been designed and skewed towards making these two things work. And they don't work at all. And so if you're an investor, I, I work with a lot of startups and they come to me pitching uh, uh, in investment rounds. They say to me, I'm going to give you a product that you use 5% of the time, and it's not used for the other time, and it's gonna be 80% empty when I use it. And it requires a tremendous amount of resources, infrastructure, and subsidies to physically make it work. And by the way, it does a lot of damage as well. Who's in to invest in this? No one. And somehow, we're all investors because of manufactured consent. We have been manufactured to basically believe that this is what we should have. And so, it's been a really uh, interesting discussion because a lot of people say oh, in, in auto-oriented cities, there's no vision. There's a clear vision. It's an auto-oriented vision and it's been ex executed. Job well done, tick, let's go home. So that's what we've been focused on. When you have that as the norm, you try to add in public transit and it fails because it's designed around the driver, it's designed around the number of vehicles, it's designed around all these subsidies. Uh, you need to over-subsidize transit because you've over-subsidized uh, auto driving, and the whole thing is this vicious cycle, it becomes worse and worse and worse, and you have reams of data on both sides saying how good and awful it is, but the fact is it's not, it's not working. And so, you know, in, in bus, in a transit example, most transit systems are overcrowded for just 90 to 120 minutes of the day, and then they're basically empty the rest of the day. So you have a misformed form factor and a um, badly designed system because it can't compete with the oversubsidized uh, transportation space that it's actually in. So you either make tweaks and adjustments or you acknowledge that it's not going to be what it is and so you have to subsidize it even more. So, you know, these are the sort of things that just become uh, in inherent in how we, how we look at these, these transportation systems. So that's basically been the last 75 years of our existence in, in transportation since World War II, since we decided to ignore economics and ignore um, market force and say, let's actually try this and see how it works. Let's mow down half the country and pave our way through it and smash through all these urban neighborhoods and do all the stuff that we did in the, for the sake of this technology to work. So job well done, but not really well done. So what's that resulted in is a lot of things that we don't like about it. There's a lot of great things that, that, that the transportation system that we have has done, and most of us were are, are products of it. We, we really couldn't get around without it. Most of us were born in hospitals or people's houses. We were delivered in certain places with them. So they've done amazing things. They've allowed most of our parents to actually have a house and, and a lifestyle that they probably couldn't have had before. And because of subsidized fuel, we've allowed to actually have things that come to us and get us around. But we know deep down that this is not working anymore. It's not, it's not, not sustainable in any way. And so, you know, on average, there's 1.2 million people killed every year around the world. It's about two people a minute. It's pretty, pretty gross. That's basically, a, uh, I did the calculation of the day. It's a 737 falling out of the sky every, every basically couple of days, every couple of hours. If that happened in aviation, we'd shut the whole thing down because we shut it down for a day when someone left their dog in an overhead cabin, right? So, um, but for some reason we allowed this to go forward because it's just the cost of doing business because we've had decades upon decades of marketing saying it's actually 
the other person's fault. And so culturally, we've had a lot of, uh, most of our vernacular about mobility is all about this kind of um, uh, programs and processes. It's really inefficient. It wastes a lot of time, money, and resources. And it, it cause, a lot of those collisions cause the disabilities that, uh, that now not allow people to engage in the economy. So this crash economy is actually really a vicious cycle as well. So just pure numbers, like I said, 1.2 million people die every year because they're hit by a car or, or they're in a collision of some sort. We spend about 10 days a year commuting on average. That's if you have a good commute. Bad commutes can be up to 15, 20 days a year. So we, on average, in the US get 10 days of vacation. So we have another 10 days that we spend just commuting, getting to A and B. So that's a lot of, that is a lot of questions about our culture. We all have to wake up. We all have to eat. We all have to go to, we all have to do work. Um, unless we have universal basic income, we still have to work. <laughs> and so we have to work. We want to socialize. We want to see people. We want to go to things. So to do all those things, creates ebbs and flows of, of demand. And so um, how we get there is really important. And then from an access perspective, you know, 15% of, of people worldwide have some sort of disability, whether it's a visible disability or an invisible disability, that actually holds them back from maintaining full employment of some sort. And so it's a, it's a, it's a big gamble to put all of our eggs in, in this basket. Luckily, in the last five years, so think back 2013, um, we had a lot of tremendous change in technology, which has actually really started to turn this paradigm and start to question it. So from the development of, of 3G wireless, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, smartphone technology, those things basically started creating the ingredients for these new services to start popping up. It wasn't until the thing on the far right, which is an, it was basically APIs, um, allowing the tech to talk to each other to link the routing, to link the booking, to link the payments, those things created those layers of abstraction between you and the service that allowed us now to provide all these different kinds of, of opportunities. So the, the whole linkage of the last five years of technology really has created and spawned all of these things that we just didn't think were possible. We wanted them, but we didn't think they were possible. Uh, but we also didn't realize we can't live without. And cultural change has happened uh, because of that as well. Six years ago, it was difficult to find people that were interested in sharing their photos and telling people what they were doing in their private life. Today, it's difficult to find people that are not interested in doing that, right? So people are oversharing. People are addicted to their smartphones because of the way that we develop notification systems to constantly ping you and tell you, you're important, you're important, you're important, but you're actually not. So um, <laughs> what they're saying is, I want your data, I want your data, I want your data. So um, that's been a very interesting, tremendous shift and so what that's done in, in combination, think of the beginning of, of, of Uber and Lyft and then all the different car share, ride share and, and um, other services around the world, bike sharing and now scooter sharing, really started to question that whole thing of like, is it a binary system or is it actually more than that? So having said that, the downside is no one's paying attention anymore to anything. So uh, people are walking, not paying attention. People are driving, not paying attention. We've passed the point where we as humans can safely operate machinery. We really have, we've hit that threshold. And so we now need to start thinking, well, what's, how do we actually deal with this? So there's the blame way of saying, well, people just shouldn't text, they shouldn't do this and stuff. I've spoken to tons and tons of different focus groups uh, in my previous work. And the most telling trend of where we're heading is the under 22 year old. So who's under 22? Any doogie houses here? Okay. Um, <laughs> The under 22 year olds were saying that, you know, we hear this thing that, you know, about, dist about uh, texting is, you know, uh, is distracted driving. We think driving is distracted texting, <laughs> you know. So we think getting into anything that's not connected is actually a waste of our time. We don't want to do it. So that's a really interesting shift in how we perceive of this with the digital native uh, population saying, this is actually not what we want to do anymore. And what's interesting is that we're seeing this like sunsetting of this binary policy system and then like this sunrise, this dawning of this integrated multimodal transportation system that is being forced by some very interesting push-pull factors that will be resisted and, and uh, complemented and, 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 and pushed and promoted by all various different groups. And so you as transportation experts in the future are going to have to deal with all of this. So it's going to be fun. Um, 
And the interesting thing about this, this dawn is that it's just beginning. We're just starting to see the, the signs that would start to happen. And we're already seeing the status quo getting really edgy about it and, and cagey. So, you know, when you push, the saying I always say is when you push the status quo, they'll push back. So be prepared for that pushback and what that looks like. We've had things like the bike lash and now the scooter lash. Like it's all these things that basically come up because it's too new, it's too quick, and we haven't had a chance to really talk it through. But technology doesn't wait for discussion. Technology wants to move forward at the rate that it can. And so where we're moving in the future, and we're already in this process right now, is this triple uh, combination of developing a more shared system, um, developing electrifi an electrified system, and then developing the automated system. And they're gonna happen in sequences and in parallels. Um, they're not gonna happen in a linear fashion. There'll be uh, fits and starts here and there. But, and it won't happen everywhere, and it won't happen to everybody, but it will actually start moving through more and more. And that's what I really wanted to uh, address in that, in your education that you have here, this is really what you'll be working on um, and working through, should you choose to want to participate in this, this movement, but it'll be all-encompassing. It's gonna be a very interesting uh, opportunity, and there'll be a lot of resistance along the way as well. And so, on shared, shared is not only sharing a ride with somebody else. Shared is sharing a facility or a thing. And so you may be by yourself, but you're sharing something. And so I think understanding the difference between shared together versus sharing a thing is actually going to be a really important uh, distinction with uh, all the movement in our transportation system. Electrification is going to be happening. It just makes a lot of sense. Whoops, I should have turned that off. Sorry. Um, Electrification is going, to be, is, is going to be moving forward at a rate that is determined based on, on a bunch of factors, whether it's the economy, whether it's preferences, whether it's movement. But we're at the beginning of this J-curve where things are starting to electrify and then the pressing question of the infrastructure and all these different pieces start becoming much more obvious. It just makes a lot of sense. ICE engines have tens of thousands of parts. Electric engine has dozens of parts. So just simpler. For a fleet model, it makes more sense to have electric because it can have a longer range and it's simpler to maintain. Um, so, but there's an issue with electric in that you need to charge them and so you're losing time, valuable time, when that vehicle could be on the market. So some of you have, may have seen some studies recently where uh, some of the ride hailing companies tried to influence some of the, their driver partners, is a nice term, to use uh, electric vehicles, but the charge time was basically eating into, this, into their, their livelihood. So, Understanding the, the trade-offs and, and getting that ready is going to be really interesting. So rapid charging is really important, but rapid charging is at its nascency. And then with automated, I'm going to talk a little bit about automated because I've been working on this for about two years now uh, in, the, in the bowels of, of, of the, the, the arguably the most advanced automated system in the world and really learning and understanding the tech uh, and then seeing its application of what we can actually do with, with cities. So there's a lot of pieces in the automated piece that I want to just touch on. But firstly, on the sharing piece, we're already seeing different forms of, of vehicles coming up, whether it's a scooter or a bike or some sort of moped. They really did push the envelope, uh, trying to get cities to think about this in ways that were not really clear in the past. And now the cities are getting their hands around it, and now they've started to raise a lot of capital. They flood them with a dockless variety as well. So all of these different things are kind of moving. But it's just starting to press that envelope of it's not just a car or a bus. It's a whole accordion of things in between. And so it depends on the trip and it depends what they want to do it for. And, and we really ought to be around it because it just makes the system more efficient. Same with um, the larger transportation system. This is now going through its process of sharing with a lot of the apps that link themselves to each other. We're going to see a lot of this moving forward. But what's going to be more interesting is um, once we get to the electrification phase where more of these vehicles are electrified, you're going to start seeing more fleets being used because they're much sturdier, they can actually uh, operate longer, they can do more of these things. What's interesting though is that the shared and electric is going to do a lot of radical changes to the way that we perceive transportation, how we get around. But if you can keep a focus on the, the vehicles, when I, when I add the automated, what's gone? Right, that's the big change. And so when we see that happen, a lot of things are gonna change. Most of our transport system right now is designed around the driver's needs. How much can they be in the vehicle? How, do, how often can they service the vehicle? How often can they drive the vehicle? How your entire transit system is dictated around 
the number of, vi of drivers and what they can actually do with the, with the system, how often they can drive, how long they can drive for, etc., etc. Take all of that out of the equation and you have a completely different system now. It can reach things that are not market-oriented right now, they're not, they're not viable. <laughs> you can go to more places, you can go deeper into neighborhoods, all of these different opportunities that, that can happen. And with deliveries as well, it's not restricted by the driver anymore, so the, 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 thing, the thing can be a 24-hour delivery service. And so these things can be very, very um, uh, profound in how they impact uh, how we expect and perceive the things around us. The biggest change will be the way that we view ourselves in these vehicles. To this point, uh, anything that is requiring you to drive is a, what we call a manually operated vehicle. Even though it's automatic, you still have to manually operate it. And so whether it needs you to pay attention to the surroundings, the steering wheel, the brakes, or the pedals, it's not an automated vehicle, no matter what they tell you in the, in the press, right? So if it requires any assistance whatsoever, it's, a, it's an assisted vehicle. It gives you, it's a driver-assisted vehicle. The difference with an automated vehicle is that you're the rider now. You're no longer the driver. And as the rider, the entire vehicle changes. Because as the driver, what's the most important thing as a driver? It's your dashboard. What do you see around you? What are the critical elements? Everything's focused on the, on the dashboard. In an automated vehicle, it's about the rider experience. Everything is about the rider and the rider's experience and what they experience inside the vehicle as well. So the vehicle shapes will change, the interiors will change, all of these things will change uh, over time. On the left is a manually driven operated vehicle with driver assisted and safety features. On the right is an autonomous vehicle that doesn't need you to control the brakes, pedals or, or the speed. How it works is through a very complex and complicated integrated system, which I'm going to explain in about 15 to 30 seconds. Um, a really good tool when you're in planning school is how do you disseminate 200 pages of analysis to like a pithy, a pithy couple of sentences. So basically, we use artificial intelligence, an AI compute platform that interacts with, through machine learning and deep learning and, and neural networks, which means what it basically does is it classifies, it learns, it understands, and it predicts and, and, and uh, perceives its surroundings. It asks itself four fundamental questions. Where am I? So what's around me? What's everybody uh, doing? Uh, like, where are they going? Uh, where are they going? And then what should I do next? So the what should I do next is the whole computation of what's the safe path of travel. And so to do that, the vehicle needs to physically see, hear, express, and touch. So it needs a sensor suite. That sensor suite needs to be LiDAR for detecting objects and, and, and distances, radar for movement and, and travel, and then cameras for vision. And there's a whole fusing that happens with that, uh, and then all of that basically combines to allow the vehicle to physically move. So it's not rocket science. It's actually much harder than rocket science. Uh, in fact, we have a couple of people in our, in, on my old team that actually put the rover on Mars. And when they say things were hard, I believe them. Like, it was hard. This stuff is yeah. difficult. Because to launch a rocket from point to point requires ridiculous amounts of, of math and algorithms, but it's point to point. You've got to make sure that it gets to that point. A vehicle that has all this stuff every day around it to, to move is, is, in, is orders of magnitude more complex. And so there's a plane of complexity and, and travel speed. The more complex the environment, the slower the speed, the more, um, uh, the less complex the environment, the faster the, the travel can happen. So a freeway or, or a railway line is much more straightforward to automate than a very urban, you know, downtown, busy neighborhood in Mumbai, for example. It's going to be really difficult to do that uh, initially. But it's going to get there. Uh, we already have automated vehicles. We have automated people movers, and we have some automated metros. But again, level of complexity is very, very narrow. Um, much easier to, to navigate. The other piece is the mapping. So it doesn't know where to go unless it actually has a map to actually follow. And those maps are really complex. They're not like the Google Maps that we had many years ago. They're a 3D, full immersion map that understands and perceives everything around it. And that mapping technology is really difficult to um, expand without some heavy duty computing because you just don't need algorithms, you need a whole bunch of stuff behind that. The vehicles have to understand what's a tree, what's a person, what is a street sign. Is a street sign on the back of a construction truck moving at 35 miles per hour? Yes it is, but it's actually not something you have to follow. So those are the kinds of things that he has to look at. 
And then from that, he has to say, like, okay, there's a person in a wheelchair and they're moving across. What's their trajectory? Oh, I'm giving you a real example here. They're holding a broom and they're shooing an animal. What's that animal? Oh, it's a bird. What kind of bird is it? It's a guinea fowl. Guinea fowl moves at 1.345 seconds per second per minute, and then th that's where it's going. So that's the kind of complexity that it has. So when people said, hey, we're going to do this really quickly and just, we just need bits and pieces, I'd be very skeptical. You know, uh, Google's been doing this for nine years for a reason. It's really hard. And so now that we're, they're ready to launch, it just gives you a level of, of confidence of how much work has been involved to get it to that point. So if you had this on its own, it's a pretty impressive thing because it can do a lot of in incredible stuff for our systems. Um, it can help us reduce collisions, it can help us reduce fatalities, it can help reduce the size of our fleets. All these things are great. If all we did was reduce the 1.5 million deaths a year and nothing else, that'd be great. But society won't be satisfied with that because the bigger question is, well, what does it actually do uh, for us in our season stuff? And so to do that, we're going to have this discussion of whether or not we're going to have fleets of autonomous vehicles or whether we're going to have privately owned and operated vehicles. And I, I'll, I'll, give you some, I'll give you a hint. It's going to be more of the fleet at the beginning because of a lot of different factors. One is it's really hard to operate, manage, and, and control. Uh, there's a lot of updates and a lot of software and hardware that needs to be constantly calibrated. From a fleet perspective, it just makes a lot more sense. But also, it allows for a lot more people to access and understand and, and use this service. And so that's one of the areas that I think is going to be really pushing the idea of fleets. Mm -hmm. To develop a service, because um, I've been doing it for the last two years, after you have all the AI compute and the sensor stuff, it's pretty basic stuff. I mean, this is, I'm being facetious here, it's like it's really hard. So you've <laughs> got to have a fleet, you've got to have the fleet, the sensor suite actually has attached to the vehicle, that's actually work. So a lot of reliability testing and a lot of off-road testing, did the things actually crack? You know, we were in Phoenix because it's, you know, 50 degrees centigrade during the summertime and like zero minus five centigrade during the wintertime in the hills. Um, a, lot of a lot of dust storms. So all of these things were great opportunities to learn. It's the fastest square metropolitan area in the country. So all of these things to learn about, you know, why choose Phoenix, if the Bay Area, testing in Detroit because of black ice, black ice and snow and sleet, and then in Washington for the, snow, for the rain, doing fleet testing in Atlanta with the hubs logistics stuff. So a lot of different places to learn all the different use cases and really stress test the technology to see where does this actually make sense. And so a lot of that secret source was actually in that, that development of the, the shared fleet. But once you have all that down, um, you just need another ride hailing app attached to it and it kind of works. So, um, you know, tick, easy, right? So that was the, that's, the, that's why I think we're going to see a lot more of the fleet model come forward because it just gives more access to more people to do a lot more things. Once this gets uh, a densified network, uh, it can basically be a software switch where it will carry more people or less people and all those variable products inside the, inside the vehicle become viable. So you really just need those, those, those pieces in place first for it to actually work. And what's going to be interesting is because we are no longer the driver, we're going to be the rider, the interior will radically change. And so, yes, we'll have traditional seats and traditional style seats on the left-hand side. And yes, we'll, have, we'll be standing upright like we do right now in a, in, a, in a vehicle of some sort. But it's this middle area that's going to be very interesting of like, what could it actually be like as we want to do it for different things. So long distance travel, um, after a long day of work or whatever it is that you're doing, how can this interior actually work for you? Um, can you use it for an office? Can you use it for all these things that we could potentially think about? The answer is yes and. It can be do all these things. The question is who's gonna do it and how's it gonna actually uh, actuate? And to me, these are the interesting things that what we can see that will create um, some interesting social norms that we haven't really thought through. So it's going to be just interesting to see how this actually pans out uh, in, in the near future. Where will this start first is what I get asked all the time. Okay, so where are we going to see this first? Well, we're going to see it in Phoenix first. Um, it's going to be in the suburb of Phoenix. And the reason for that was because it's that sweet spot. You know, if anybody is an a, a astronomer, it's that, that habitable zone where it's the safe place to, to start. That's basically uh, an area where the roads are, are, are of a certain standard, the grids are a certain standard, the topography, the geography, 
the demographics, all of those stuff means it's a, it's a good viable use case. So are many other cities, um, but you would never have thought that it'd be a, it would be basically uh, it would be basically a place here and not where everyone thinks is here. This is where all that shared mobility soup is. You probably don't need these passenger AVs there for a while. And you probably won't have them out here either because the use case just isn't there for them yet. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to start seeing a lot more AV fleets in these areas, some in here, a lot more shared mobility densification in here. And then we're going to see some of these experimental trips with uh, some of these shared services. But most of the car ownership will, start, will stay here and keep edging out that way. And then eventually it'll, it'll catch up because it just needs orders of magnitude of, of, of density and also of fleet uh, network theory principles to actually go into effect for it to work. So we'll see, we'll see it in different pieces and different iterations, but a scaling of it will happen uh, in the middle rings and then move further in. And that comes down to really the form factor. The, the, the traditional passenger vehicle won't make sense for a lot of the trips inside here, but may make sense here and then may make sense out here, but we're going to see different form factors that make sense, which is like a personal scooter or something like that, and I'll, I'll touch about that a little bit in a second. What's going to be profound, though, is how this impacts our transportation system and how we actually want it to actually work in our cities. As we said, we're moving towards a city planet. Most of this travel will be urban. What does it actually look like? Our streets and roads uh, will be allowed to, we can play with them and actually change them in ways that we want to. And I think what's really important right now is that many cities and many authorities are saying, how is this going to impact me? Versus the question should be reversed. How do I want this to impact my city? And think of it as the icing on the cake of your transportation cake. It's not the main ingredient. Uh, the main ingredient is walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented mixed-use communities. And AV is basically the icing on top that makes it actually work really well and, and makes it effective. So this is the time right now of the next decade to start really being serious about what do you want the streets to look like. We need dedicated bike lanes everywhere. We need high-vis crosswalks. We need to have public places and spaces. We need to have dedicated transit lanes for high occupancy vehicles. We need to really start pushing this through because AV technology is agnostic. It doesn't have a moral compass. It's programmed to do what it's supposed to do. If it's programmed to go everywhere that it can, it will. If it's programmed to avoid the pedestrian zone, it'll avoid it. So it's what we want it to do. And that's a really big, important question of it's up to us to determine what we want this AV tech uh, to do. Parking is over, basically is the best way to describe it. There will really won't be much need for parking and any city that is planning on building a hundred or two hundred million dollar parking structure is really wasting their money and it's probably going to be coming a really big issue in the next couple of years where we start seeing that you don't really need to do this. Um, try telling that to people today when they're looking at saying I need that parking spot, I need that space. So the good thing is we have tools right now. It's called Transportation Demand Management. Anyone who's thought about 101 TDM stuff, you can organize these programs right now. When I worked for the city, we uh, developed a, a partnership agreement with back then with uh, Uber, Lyft, CarShare, BikeShare, all the different services in lieu of parking for a big development in the southwest called Park Merced. Everyone laughed at us. They thought it was going to happen, and it got oversubscribed in a matter of days. So. Now the developers won't even build the secondary parking structure. So all of these things now are, are at our fingertips and AI will push that even more. So anything we haven't done properly in terms of policy or we're hiding because of subsidy, AI will shine the light on and say, oh, excuse me, what about this? So because if we don't deal with it, it's like, well, they'll just say, don't worry, I'll just go around it. I'll, I'll do it myself. So if we haven't marked out all the spaces for people spaces, AV tech will take up that space because it's all about optimization. And it's constantly learning about how we can optimize this space. And so our, our outcomes of what we want as a city or a region are going to be really important to state them up front and then to use them as our North Star as this technology gets more and more mature to start feeding in and actually working towards the goals rather than away from the goals. So you guys know all this. I'm just reiterating it so that we, we're all on the same page. And what that means is that public agencies are going to have to have a really hard look at public transit, as we know it today, and the taxi system, 
and really start thinking about what is the true cost of moving a person or a thing from A to B? What's the price that we should be paying to move a person from A to B? And what are we willing to pay someone or something to move a person from A to B? Because it's all over the place. Taxi driver makes a, barely makes a living wage. Ride hailing people don't make a living wage. And then bus drivers make you know, 80 grand or 100 grand with all these benefits. So what's the actual real price of that? And how do we get that full cost accounting in, back into our transportation system? How do we undo the 1940s and 60s in, in, in the 2020s and get that full cost accounting and, and economics back in our transportation system? It's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way because we're going to shine a light on a lot of the hidden things we don't want to deal with. But we have to deal with them because the AI tech will just push forward that discussion. And so we need to deal with that very soon. So what's the transition plan? Thankfully, or hope for most people, um, it's going to be a good thing for the customers. As we need less and less drivers, we're going to need to transition them into some other role. Uh, many of the folks who've done research on transit passengers and, and users of the transport system, a good number, I don't know the exact, I can't remember the exact number, but around a quarter of all users need some sort of assistance to get on and off these transportation services. So we'll need ride ambassadors, we'll need some sort of ride support services that will be part of these discussions. So it's no, we no longer need the driver, but that role may shift to something else. And also on the, on the allocation of space, um, this actually is how machine learning looks at space. And so we would classify different space and uses of space and then basically figure out how to optimize them on, on our right of way. AI compute will basically start asking the question, um, that thing on the right is not really efficient. Um, it's not the, good, not the best use of our space. So an average human needs about a square yard of space to move around or a square meter. A uh, person on a bicycle of some sort of two-wheel vehicle needs about double that for, for space around them. A person in a current passenger vehicle needs eight times that space just to be physically in the vehicle and then another, another one and a half times more of that space to physically be safe and it's moving around. If the AI compute technology can make the vehicle safer, then they can be shorter, which is great. They can move closer, but they still are taking up too much space. And so the question we have is, if they're safer and they're no longer going to be made of three tons of steel and have these V8 engines and they're, they're all much more compact and stuff, now it can fit a lot more people on that same uh, footprint. And so the idea of carrying one, two, or eight people actually becomes viable now. And so that's how we're going to be looking at space in the future. But this requires a huge policy uh, understanding that we have a fundamental flaw right now and that the first point in getting better about a problem you have is admitting actually you have a problem and then getting out of the denial phase and going through the steps to actually get to the solution. So the first, first thing is like, how are we part of the problem? How am I part of the problem? And then how am I part of the solution? And what am I willing to do to get there? How many people are willing to physically change their behavior today to do something better for the, the sustainability of our planet? Everyone says, I do, but really, how much are you willing to make that change? If you can see that everybody else around you doesn't have to change at all. So we really need to do it uh, together as, as one. So fundamentally changing some of the policies up front. And this is an example of how the computer sees the street. Basically says, wow, these are all eyeballs on my data services that I'm doing. And these are other eyeballs on my data service. They actually can't use my data right now because they're physically having to operate this vehicle. Maybe I'll automate it so they can actually spend more time with me. These are actually spending as much time with me as possible. And these are spending too much, using too much space, and I'm not getting enough of, no, I'm not getting enough eyeballs in this space. So it's, it's not just a race for safety and improvement and all those good things. It's a race to, to viewership. Because there are 10 days a year that we're all spending commuting, that we're not spending basically interacting with some sort of device. And so that's, the, you know, the, the CEO of Netflix said his biggest competition is not CBS cable, it's sleeping. That's his biggest competition. <laughs> so how do we get access to that, right? So that's the sort of stuff that we're dealing with when, in this optimized artificial intelligent world is full optimization of our biological systems. People and so, so selfish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So this is, the, <laughs> this is the thing. I mean, you know, it's funny hearing seeing outputs from the computer saying that, you know, humans take up too much space, you know? So it's like, how do we make it more compact? It's going to be interesting. And so to do that, we've really got to push the, uh, the envelope on how we do our transportation planning. In a scenario that we pushed in San Francisco without all this tech was, 
how do we get half of all the trips by walking, cycling, and transit? And how do we get half the trips by, by driving? Because we felt that that's what we could actually achieve. This will become the norm. Um, and the shared electric uh, automated future is going to actually allow this to happen uh, much more robust. This will become the baseline for most cities. Half of trips will be by walking, cycling, and everything else. Then the other half will be by these automated motorized shared services. But it's going to take transition. It's going to take time. It won't happen like tomorrow. So all those who are super excited by this graphic, it's going to be in your lifetime. It's not going to be like tomorrow. So it's, this is the sort of stuff that we need to that we know uh, that we need to push forward on. And how we can start that is where cities basically shift from being this regulator and this sometimes operator of transport services and the everything and everything to being a platform, saying that we, we own the platform, which is the right of way, and all of you are guests on our platform. You're welcome and you're invited as guests, but here are some rules. You need to move as many people as possible, you need to do it in a safe way, you need to have as least emissions as possible, you need to be able to make sure that you're moving, you're accessing as most people that, as possible as well, and you go everywhere, so it's not just in specific areas. Because even all the news that you get with ride hailing, they're moving about 1% or 2% of daily trips in most metro markets. So they're missing out on the other 98% of trips. And so having it more of a platform is saying that you all work together towards the common goal, which is to get us towards the, the people movements and people movements that we want as, as a city. Under this platform is going to be a bunch of tech. Um, and you're seeing a lot more of this thing called transportation as a service or mobility as a service, as they say in Europe. And that's the first layer, which is integrating all the routing, booking, and payment so that a, a, a person can basically pick up their service and, and go where they want to go and route, book, and pay. You don't have to worry about how to actually pull out all this change and these 15 different cards and all these different maps. And, you know, why driving works now is because it's cheap, quick, and easy, even with all the problems that you guys hate about driving, right? Because you're all... You're all pro mobility, multi mobility. Um, we've made it cheap, quick, and easy. And then think of the, the two bus, on, the two sunset bus. Not cheap. It's cheap. It's not quick. It's definitely not easy if you don't know the timetable, the, the services, and how it works, right? Bike share, ride share, scooter share. If you don't know where they are, it's not easy. Um, and put your life in your own hands to scoot down Westwood Boulevard or, or down San Marco Boulevard, it's not, it's not easy. So. We have to make it cheap, quick, and easy for all those other services so that people actually just use them and, and work them. Because where they do do them, those of you who've been fortunate to travel physically or virtually to places like Amsterdam and Copenhagen and, and uh, some of the smaller European downtown neighborhoods, it is cheap, quick, and easy because they've made it. They've spent 60 years of policy doing it. So it all comes down to how we want to uh, treat our transportation system and how we want to treat the, the people who use it um, in our services. But the AI tech that's going to be interesting is that it's going to move from just transportation as a service to basically assisted living is the best way to describe it. Your assistant at home, whether it's a, a, a digital assistant of some sort, is going to be linked and synced to your calendar, linked to weather, it's linked to all of your events, your preferences, your accounts, your money, your willingness to pay, all sort of stuff. And it's going to basically do everything for you. So we're already starting to see that now where you know, assistant talks to Nest, and Nest will basically be talking to your calendar and booking and organizing things for you. So, no, you'll no longer be late anywhere. <laughs> you'll basically be knowing that there's an event you want to go to with your friend. It's a if it's it's a it's a concert. As part of that, you've got your ticket already booked. You've got your dinner plans already organized. The transportation's already taken care of, and it's basically seamless. And so, your preferences are whether it's a sunny day today and you'd rather use a bike share to a train, or whether you want to, it's raining heavily and you need to go into an enclosed vehicle. It's really the decisions you'll be making, but they'll be your preferences, and the AI is going to basically decide for you, saying, look, I know you want to ride a bike today, but it's going to rain in 20 minutes, I'm getting you a vehicle that's going to be a shared ride. You'll be like this, okay. So you're not really going to be like, no, I want to ride my bicycle, right? Because it'll be so easy and frictionless that you won't even think about it anymore. And that raises a big question about then, what are we going to be doing as transportation people? Like, what's, what's our job? Um, and it's not just personal mobility. It's going to be freight mobility as well. The entire thing is going to be, is going to be integrated this way as well. And so it's going to raise some social norms that we haven't really discussed yet. And in a large automated vehicle that allows you to be upright and standing more or less like a transit service today, 
most of the norms that you have today will probably be in effect. They'll probably have the same, those similar norms. So you generally don't make eye contact, you're polite, you give a seat to a person who is elderly, you do all these different things. Um, or you don't, you know, you manspread, you do all these things that you should be doing. So all those things will probably still take the case, but because of the AI piece in it, there'll be a lot more gamification. So we're probably going to see people changing and tweaking their behavior somewhat because of the different place and space that they're in. What's interesting is the smaller the vehicle, and if you're going to be sharing a service with somebody else, there's no rules about that right now. We generally, when we do a ride hail and we share a ride, even if it's a carpool, we tend to make eye contact with the driver, we tend to speak with them, even if they annoy us and we don't want to talk to them, we'll just say, yeah, sure, hi, whatever. But they're there, and then if anybody's done carpooling, um, either on-demand carpooling or regular carpooling, you yeah, do feel a little weird when they step into the car because then that initial space has been taken up. And so now imagine there's no one in the vehicle, there's no human in the vehicle, it's just you two both at the same time enter a vehicle and step inside. What do you do? Do you say hi? Do you have your preferences already pre-programmed so that it's only going to be lounge music and the temperature's going to be really uh, uh, cold? Or are you going to be open to sharing that with other people that have got a different point of view because you want to have a discussion about something? All these things are going to be possible, um, but we're going to have to think about these, these norms. So the one on the right, or even the one on the left, may need ride ambassadors for the first couple of years so we get used to it. Think of elevators back in the, in the early days when they became automated. We still had elevator operators for the perception of safety and comfort level. We may need that as well for this. So a lot of like... Uh, behavioral factors are going to be uh, uh, questioned and, and put to the fore about how we interact with this. The interiors of the vehicles are going to radically change, so they're going to have a lot more LCD screens, they're going to be a lot more personalization, they're going to have haptic feedback, whether it's vibration, smell, touch or sense. So all of those things are going to allow a very different experience. There could be the most amazing video game machine that's moving uh, from point A to point B, or it could be a zen out meditation space, you know, and we just don't know, like all these things are going to be possible. So all that to say, we are just at the beginning of this. Um, and so when it comes to you and your education, how are you going to prepare yourself for this kind of, this kind of future? And I've been thinking about it a lot, I've actually uh, mentioned it to Brian a few times about the continuous need to move forward and, you know, most of our education has been spent on learning how to learn things and learning about stuff. And we're basically learning like machines. Machines are going to learn much faster and much better than us in, in that way. We have to learn about being creative and our critical thinking and our independent thought. That's what differentiates us in a soft-skilled uh, environment. And that human empathy touch is what's going to be really important in the future. But that's the future. The transition that we're in the next 10 years is going to be pushing for new roles that don't really exist and that we haven't really thought about uh, clearly in even in our transportation space. The data scientist or the urban scientist on the left, her role is going to be about analyzing data but really understanding themes and how this actually works. Where is the data most important? How do you digest this data? How do you analyze it? And what is it actually going to be utilized for? Uh, when I used to work at um, San Francisco, there's a lot of push to get data from Uber and Lyft and everything else. And I was the one raising the hand saying, how are you going to digest this data? We don't even have a working IT system. Like, wh what are you going to do? <laughs> right? So there's a huge disconnect between what you can actually use the data for um, and what are, you going to, what, 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 what are you going to do with it? And so you can't just say, I just want the data because I want to prove something. It's like, well, why don't you just ask a question and see if they can answer the question? And most, nine or ten times, they can't answer the question because what you're asking is a qualitative question that needs surveys, sensors and beacons outside rather than inside to see what's actually happening. So the big lesson learned was for $10 sensors, you can basically put a sensor at every intersection in the city for a couple of thousand dollars and you've got all the data you want on movement of, of, of people and things. Didn't need to have this one year arm wrestle with this agreement with, with this company. So that's the beauty of this urban scientist. They're going to be really clued in about what's the best way to use this data, how to get this data, how to analyze this data, and, and what do you use it for. The person in the middle is going to be having a role that's much more of a user researcher and a much more of a, of a behavioral urban psychologist. And that's really the person who's going to be understanding the themes of what people perceive as their abilities to trust. 
because all these new technologies are going to require a layer of trust that doesn't exist today. And when there isn't trust, there's skepticism, and skepticism breeds fear, and fear topples governments, and we're in this situation today. So um, you can read between all those layers of what I just said. And so there's those who feel left behind, there's the digital divide, there's all of these unbanked populations. How do we bring all of those things together? Because they're going to be pressed, uh, and the light's going to be shining on them much more deeply. And then there's all these cultural factors about it may work in one city, but it's not going to work in another city because there is a particular difference of demography or attitude or just there's just something different about the, about the place or space, weather, whatever it is. So this urban psychologist can be really, really important in how they gather all that data and then figure out what's the right way to actually message this and, and trend it. Um, and then what's most important? How do they get that behavior change? It's not the traditional methods that we've been doing today. They don't work. None of them work. So how do we do that? How do we get that group of people who are always screaming at the public meeting at 6 p.m. in the afternoon because they're retired and they can, and we're ignoring the 800,000 people who just don't have time to come to these meetings? How do we value those and how do we get those two things to be brought together? And lastly is the storyteller. The urban storyteller is going to be huge because that's a marketing role that we, me, uh, had very little training on. I, I, I subsequently got that training on urban, on urban marketing because we have to pitch this. We have to sell this and we have to constantly remind and reinforce people why this is the right way to do things. Because the history has told us last century, it ain't going to work. And if we add double the population to this, it's going to make it 10 times worse. So there's a new way and how do we tell that story? How do we engage those who feel forgotten and left behind and don't represent the country anymore? How do we get them on board? And what do we do to, to, get, to, do, to get there? How do we actually do those, those steps? And it's going to be a combination of these three roles that's going to be these pioneers that kind of get us to these acceptance places where we don't have any more of these bike, bike lashes and these scooter lashes and the robots and the sidewalk lashes and all the eyelashes that we have, right? How do we, how do we get that so that we don't have that, that kind of, of, of issue? And so that's, the, that's, that's our challenge. Um, and it's all about people. At the end of the day, it's not about transportation. It's about connecting people to their moments through movement. And if you, could, if you could remind yourself that's what you're doing, you're connecting people and things to moments in their lives through movement. And that's what we're doing. It's not about moving cars or trucks or bicycles or stuff. It's about that specific thing. And to do that, we need these three groups to work really closely together, which is why I helped co-found City Innovate because we bring government, corporations, and academia together in a neutral third space to figure this stuff out because this is really hard stuff. And everybody's coming from their own perspective and having that neutral third space and reminding those three institutions why they're here is to serve the people. And that's a really important disconnect sometimes. You're actually here to serve the people, not your bus drivers. Your job is to serve the people, the customers. So as we move forward in this uh, system, that relentless pursuit for the customer is what's going to move everything forward. And either it, or, or it won't. It'll just be left behind. And so we'll have these relics moving around, funded by local sales taxes that don't do anything, while everybody else has shifted onto this customer-oriented system. So these are the, really the, the fundamental uh, shifts that we're going to see over the next decade. It's going to be an exciting time. It's the best time to be in transportation. Um, and I'm really excited and I look forward to seeing all you guys doing amazing stuff. So thank you very much. Questions or comments? Yeah, third holder. Yes, at the back. Um, so speaking for uh, I think a lot of people in the program and a lot of the uh, snarky urbanists that I follow on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot, there's a lot of skepticism uh, toward the, the, the connected automated future saving us. So I'm ask, I wanted to ask you, what is the, the proper balance between uh, like skeptical Luddite-ism and starry-eyed tech-utopianism. Yeah, no, it's a really, that's a really important, we, we have, it's, it's, I think we both have both of them in us, right? There's days where I'm just like, this is ridiculous, not going to work. And next day I'm like, oh my God, it's amazing, this is the prequel to Star Trek, can't wait, right? <laughs> so it just, the, the 
point that you just raised though is about that middle is having discussions. We don't talk enough anymore. We spend so much time on this, we're actually not talking anymore. So getting people back into the room and talking and talking through like, what are your fears? What are your concerns? What are your hopes? What would you like it to actually do? It's coming, it's not, it's not going away. So that's why I was saying that in the previous uh, pie that I showed that we need half of it is the walking, bus and transit, which is what all those snarky, you know, urbanists want. But to get there, they're nowhere near there right now. It's actually going backwards. So for them to get there, they need to embrace the tech that will keep this thing constant. But also remind the techie, opt the techno optimists that it's not just this, it's not the business class reclining seat and it's a massage. It's not just that. You have to still do everything else because otherwise we're going to turn to Wally. You know, we, we want to we want to make sure it's balanced. So it's a constant recalibration, and that's the role of the of the government, frankly, of the cities to be the one who's the platform keeper and the referee and the coach. You know, I used to I joke sometimes. But, you know, that role is the guardian of the galaxy. Like, you need to be that. That's your role, is to protect and ensure that it actually works. But you've got to be clear up front about what you stand for. Because AI compute does what it's told. So if you don't stand for anything, it's like, well, okay, then, I'm going to optimize. You say, no, no, I stand for this, this, and this, and here's the gates that you can work in. Here are the guardrails. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll work within these guardrails. It doesn't say, I don't want to work in these guardrails. I want to go outside. It's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. So the, the, the answer to your question is have more conversations and listen to people. Actually, what are they, what are they actually really concerned about? Yeah, that's a good question. Somebody else raise a hand. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then you, and then you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know your name, sorry. I'm not, I don't know. Maybe you just want to say your name quick. Yeah. So I'm curious that I think many people, at least in, in California, the, some of their values of that they hold for the, the platform is also um, having a strong workforce. Yes. And uh, you, you spoke really briefly about how um, bus operators may transition to um, ride ambassadors. Kind of, that is like yeah. ride ambassadors for right. uh, AV. And I, want you, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how you envision there being a kind of a, a vibrant kind of um, strong workforce to, to support this emerging technology. Yeah, so, and you know, it's going to be a transition. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take a, a, a while. And I think the, the, the first thing is to understand that it's, it's, going, to, it's going to happen. We, we, are, we are no longer going to need these driver type roles, whether it's driving a, a passenger vehicle or a large vehicle or a truck, even an airport control vehicle, those things that dock the planes from the gate that won't be needed anymore as a, as, a, as a person in there. So all those roles are going to need to be transitioned into something else. At the same time, the fleets of AVs that come out are going to need orders of magnitude of, of people, whether it's the initial test mappers, whether it's the people who actually run and operate the depots, all the managerial roles that run from being these like city managers who run the different pieces. So it's kind of like a shift. It's like it's no longer going to just be like the bus and the bus agency. It's going to be this AV system that needs a bunch of people, mechanics, services, users, uh, repairers, cleaners, mobile maintenance, all that sort of stuff. And if you scale it the way that it's probably going to scale, it's going to require a lot more people than we think until we can start figuring out ways to become more efficient. So it's going to be this constantly oscillating thing of you're here and now you're here and now you're here. So it's the key is to acknowledge that it's there, develop, develop a job transitioning uh, program, so we can, we've done this before, we've done it with all the different uh, factors of the economy. It's just gonna happen at such a scale this time that we need to have all hands on deck to figure out what does that transition process actually look like. And luckily we have a good five to 10 years to really get it right. So it shouldn't feel as bumpy as the other ones have when we had these shocks where there's no longer needed for this particular role. But history has shown us that we've done this in the past and technology generally, and I say generally, provides a whole new era of new jobs and new services that didn't exist before. The question is, is are those people going to be able to participate in those new jobs? And that's where you need a transition force uh, work program develop. And a lot of tech companies are already investing in this. Like I know my previous company, Alphabet, they're investing in a transition job transition fund. They're identifying the key uh, players who can actually train and have those training programs. And also, with the, on, the, on the transit side in particular, anything that's mass size like that, there's a good portion of people that still need assistance to get on and off the vehicle so that 
the role will still be there, just won't be driving. You know, and you know, I used to work at the MTA. Many of the bus drivers that I worked with with our strategic plan were like, I actually hate driving the bus. I love talking to the people and the passengers and, and being the guide. I hate the physical driving because it's so stressful. It hurts my knees. I'm constantly standing still. So it's not that people want to do this. It's like it's a it's a good job. It's just that that rather they also might, might be rather be doing something else as well. Yeah, it's a great question though. You? Okay. Yeah. Like all of them are like, oh, you can't figure out how, or it's, you're kind of like, one party wants to do this and you kind of pull the other two to yeah. the table. Um, and then the other question, you mentioned that you didn't learn about storytelling in school, but it's important and you learn it. Um, how did you learn it? And uh, like, what did you On the job. <laughs> um, so the first question is, uh, City Innovate basically uh, has a strong network of startups and corporations that want access to cities. We also have a strong network of cities that want problems to be solved quickly. So Startup in Residence is a program where we match the problem statement that, that a city provides with the startup. We bring the startup in residence in the city for 16 weeks and they solve the problem. So whether it's a process problem or a procurement problem, whatever it is, we basically match them and they solve it. So we've been doing it a couple of times now. And it basically reduces this two-year process down to 16 weeks because the city says, here is my particular problem. Don't sell me a widget. I need a solution to this problem. We bring in a hungry little eager, eager beaver startup. It's like, oh, I want to cut my teeth on this. And we match them. And then in 16 weeks, they basically resolve the issue. Whether it's digitization, whether it's a process improvement, whether it's the fact that they've got like, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that's not in a digital format, whatever it is, we work out. And this year, we're starting with urban mobility. So we're going to be developing model RFPs, uh, model ordinances, model curb management, all those different things that the city is actually reaching out to us saying, we need your help. Like help us. We need we need a standardized way of doing this. So that's that's the answer to your first question. The second question of storytelling, it's do it. Just keep doing it and, and present and be out there and learn. There are online classes you can do on how to how to be a good storyteller. Um, there's actually a faculty person I can't remember that person's name that uh, talks about it in the visual arts um, group here in UCLA. The film school I think is a has a storytelling group. So yeah, you have the resource here. The best, best thing about you slaves is just ask the question and someone knows the answer, which is great. You know, it's like, how do I do this? Oh, someone in this campus knows. So yeah, the marketing is where I think is the really important part though. How do Next week you can do some storytelling. Yeah, <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> yeah, you got your finals, right? You got to present your storytelling. So it's, um, and just YouTube, it's really easy. YouTube. Yes. Are uh, you and then you, yeah. Um, he put his hand up first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, so it seems like uh, other than the cost uh, uh, reductions we'll experience after we fire all the Uber drivers, the primary benefit of automated vehicles is safety and reduced vehicle deaths. And I'm wondering, is there research or is anyone asking uh, of how many of those 1.5 or 1.2 million deaths might actually be prevented by autonomous vehicles? Especially given that it seems like a, the first uh, autonomous vehicles are likely to be, you know, f former truck drivers or TNC drivers, so professional drivers who hopefully have uh, safer driving practices than the general public. Um, so yeah, like, is, is there anyone? Is there is there any information on how many deaths and injuries might be prevented by AVs? Because it's not going to be all of them. Some right. are not preventable. But yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think so. I think the if I can just reframe it, there's a lot of stuff we can do now to prevent these deaths that have nothing to do with AVs, right? The five E's. Everybody knows the five E's. If you don't know the five E's, you need to go and learn. It's like engineering, ed education, enforcement, um, what are the <laughs> <laughs> Engineering, enforcement, education. Evaluation, equity. Evaluation, equity. No, no, no. Education and enforcement. Education, enforcement. Anyway, the five E's. <laughs> I've just gone blank. I don't remember them anymore. Um, they're really important. Yeah, there's five of them. So learn the five E's, but basically street, de basically street design, street design, street rules, the law, following the law, designing for prevention, and all this stuff. So what that basically means is with the Vision Zero Traffic Safety Movement is we know things are going to happen, but they shouldn't result in death or severe injury. So 
a vision zero traffic safety program allows for mistakes to happen. It just doesn't allow, doesn't matter, doesn't basically result in death. So we can do all of that. If every city in the world implemented vision zero traffic safety, that number would come down probably 80%. I'm guessing 70, 80%. If we had AVs as part of that, then maybe the the vehicle to vehicle collisions, especially the vehicle to pedestrian collisions, those things could also could also be minimized. There's no uh, there's no one out there saying it's going to go down to absolute zero. It it's going to come down a ton though. You know the question is, will it just be the AVs that do it, or will it be because to assume that AVs will do all that means everything has to be AV, and we're not going to have that for a while. We're going to transition. So. I would say you need to stick more in the five E's first and really focus on the five E's and then see how AVs do it. Again, I keep going back to this policy question of we need to stay what we want and then bring AVs into that, that program. Not say, I'm done, AVs are gonna solve everything, which some cities have said to me, I don't have to do anything anymore, right? Because AVs will solve it all. I'm like, no, it's gonna make, you're gonna really need to think this through. So yeah, you're in the middle. Yes? In the example you gave of our assistant that collects information and then says, oh, don't bike because it's going to rain. The, if all of our intentions were good, that sounds great, but that is going to be a product that's sold to us, given to us. How do we protect the information that it collects non-stop about us, I mean, in our homes, and uh, this partnership is great, but long-term, is this three-part partnership going to be able to protect us from being manipulated, I mean, as we've seen? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that question. <laughs> That's beyond even my comprehension. It's up to you, basically, as a citizen, what do you think you can do about it? Okay. You vote. Did you vote? I hope you voted today, so it's like, I'm yeah. going to vote after this. <laughs> Good, because that's, that's, it's up to the citizens on what they want, because again, claiming what you want and then sticking to it, because we've had the whole thing about Europe with GDPR, and we've seen what that's done. You've got a hundred emails saying, do you really want to continue with me? So the whole thing about digital literacy, but also digital citizenry is going to be really important. In the v near future, we're going to be voting, we're going to be voting through an assistant of some sort. So. Those are big questions. Like my my friend actually talks about this a lot. It's like, what role does democracy have in this digital landscape? It's a huge question. Blows my mind, right? We have to we have to we have to be very clear about what we what we stand for and what we don't stand for. Oh, wow, a lot of hands. So you UCLA top, then you in the back, then you sir, and then Jin Yu. So mm -hmm. so on the um, the note of voting, have there been any public opinion polling? polls done on how millennials, what millennials think about all this automation going on, what sort of future like they want it to pull this, you know, high tech, you know, future where it's going to, you know, risk a lot of jobs, but it's also going to be a lot of benefits you know, for our everyday lives. Yeah, it's, it's very generational. So a lot of the polls, if you believe polls anymore, I don't believe any poll I read anymore. Um, <laughs> just, just how it is. But if you believe a lot of the surveys that have been out there, um, it's generational. So people who are younger tend to be much more optimistic about all this sort of stuff, much more interested, much more concerned about uh, the environment and the impact of the environment. People who are uh, at retirement age are really concerned about it. People who are post-retirement age are looking forward to not having to drive themselves around. Um, and then the working middle who are the parents raising the kids are kind of 50-50. They're kind of skeptical, interested. One, one anecdote I can give you is that we've had some families in the... Um, so I've left when I keep saying they, but it's keep saying we. They had uh, a few families in the, the vans in the Phoenix area, and the way that they've changed their behavior has been quite interesting. Like they, they do a lot of the homework with the kids in the van because they're no longer driving. Because it's a suburban area where you drive everywhere to everything. So they're much more able to engage with their kids more. They're saying that they're getting half an hour of their life back every day. So all of these things, I've got pluses um, and minuses depending on the the situation. It's just not a panacea to everything. It's gonna be it's gonna challenge a lot of the perceptions and values that we have. But it does vary by generation of where they're at. Yeah. You at the back. Um, yeah, so what do you think sorry, uh, what do you think is the city's role or the government's role in 
uh, ensuring that uh, citizens are protected from, um, I guess, uh, some form of greed with self-driver, self-driving companies. Uh, for example, with data protection or um, moving too quickly. And how do you ensure that there's not just one, or is, should there also be a push to make sure it's not a monopoly? I know that the more data you collect, like the economies of scale, it's very difficult to yeah. catch up to. Like yeah. Google has done. Right. I mean, so if you've asked a few questions in there, let me see if I can. The monopoly one. You know, the, well, the monopoly one. So we have a monopoly right now. It's called the government runs most of our transport system. So we have a monopoly there. Um, do we want that monopoly anymore? Big question for us to ask that question. Um, I think it's going to come down to performance metrics. What do we want the transportation system to actually do? We have, a, we have a binary system now where we have this privately owned, publicly subsidized system and a publicly owned, publicly subsidized access for all, even though most people don't want to use it. And so we have this thing that we have right now. And then we have this digital interface that says, I actually can provide a publicly available private system. And I think I can do it better, I think, right? Because the jury's still out. If you're an Uber or Lyft bleeding billions of dollars a year, that's not really sustainable. So do we state that value that we want that thing to operate and optimize it for everybody? And who is actually part of that? So the platform is really the, just the, the way that the city can do that. I guess the protecting part was if Waymo has um, first to market, it has the AI, and like the more data you have, the faster it learns it's like really difficult for your competitors to catch up. And if Waymo and Alphabet are already collecting with all of our data through everything else, what is the government's role if that like turns out to be the best provider of this technology in ensuring that our data is not continuously collected and um, unscrupulous, like, uh, like, oh, you don't want to run a bike today, you want to ride a Waymo car, um, et cetera. Like, how do we, what is the government's role in ensuring that doesn't happen? Yeah, I'm actually going to put that question back to you. What do you think the government's role is to do that? Um, you know, some European style data protections or app options that opt out. Um, I would say like requiring that or somehow having an agreement that the technology of like self-driving gets passed on between companies so that like, oh, my LiDAR is amazing and it's not going to kill people. Like, how do I share this with all the other companies? Because the goal should be to save lives, not be first to market um, with regard to the technology. And um, probably some restrictions on um, where and when you can be shown ads or what can be collected um, in certain vehicles and if there's opt out options. Yeah, I mean, I agree to all that. It's like, yeah. So, again, citizenry what does the citizenry actually want? How unified do you think the citizens are behind what they want? That's going to be our job to get that unification happening, because it's not. It's completely all over the place. I can tell you there's a dozen more people that will push all of what you set aside for the idea to be able to like, lounge back and be driven around everywhere. So that's what we have. You know, we, need to, we need to understand what does that actually mean for our, tr our, our whole transportation system, but also our society as well. But yeah, it's a really good, really good, important question. Yep. I was wondering if you could comment on Waymo's announcement of purchasing as many as 60,000 Chrysler Pacific uh, minivans, which are um, hybrids, where that fits on the evolutionary timeline you've been talking about. And also the, that yeah. Hybrid versus pure electric and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I can't speak specifically about the details there, but what I can tell you is that they're preparing, we're getting ready for launch, so they're just getting more vehicles to, to launch the ride hailing service. Um, they're using the hybrid vehicle because that's what's available at that scale. It's very difficult to get that many electric vehicles right now. And so they're getting what they can get. Um, and they're working on every partnership they can to get what they can get. And as soon as they get more, they'll, they'll add more to it. But the goal's always been electric. It's just the range, the whole charging infrastructure, all that sort of stuff is a real, real uh, issue. And so the hybrid's this nice stopgap for now. But remember, the vehicle can be used a lot, so they're not going to last that long. Um, one of the things that people don't realize is that in fleets, their vehicles are used 10 times more than what they use in a, in a private. <coughs> so a private person may use a vehicle for 10, 15,000 miles a year, 
a fleet's going to use it for 150, 200,000 miles. They're going to maximize it. And that's with a person in it who can only handle it about 12 to 14 hours a day. A robot can go 24 hours a day. As long as there's demand, it'll be used. And so they're going to wear out really fast, or they're going to have to redesign the vehicles to be much more uh, able to handle that wear and tear. But yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, yes, you. Um, first, I want to respond to a point you made at the beginning of your presentation, which was basically a rhetorical question uh, asking what investor would want to uh, invest in a system that is five per, used 5% five of the time and right. is empty 80% of the time. Uh, and part of the answer is, in fact, a large part is that auto companies, investors in auto companies, and even in such mundane services as payment companies in the 20th century, eerily invested in these services. And, uh, really were more successful in selling their services to customers and to cities uh, before cities really caught on to regulating and planning for these services. Um, bring this back to autonomous vehicles, I know that, um, of course, the autonomous vehicle enterprise is one that's driven by the private sector and there are many different companies working on this that I assume don't all share the same vision. So I'm wondering what gives you sort of the, um, or how you uh, are, con what gives you the confidence uh, to assert that um, this shared uh, mobility future is the most probable outcome uh, of autonomous vehicles. Uh, a second question uh, is what is the role of transit service uh, and transit agencies in the era of autonomous vehicles? Uh, you've only touched on Trans agencies very briefly. Okay. Um, yeah, I could talk about this for five hours and cover every single topic, so I apologize mm -hmm. I didn't cover that the area that you wanted. On your first statement, I mean, the only reason why that was all possible is because of massive subsidies in the rest of the system. And but so. Those, those came after, mm -hmm. for a large part. Not before as well. In Los Angeles, at least. Yeah, so maybe one city, I'm talking about the world. So these were put in place, the whole oil infrastructure was put into place. All the things that the vehicles need, the, the metal, the, the steel mills, that was all put into place to make this work. So it was a sound investment back then, but if you're starting it with no subsidies, the system doesn't make sense. My whole point was that without all that background subsidy, it's not possible to make this work. And so that, that's the reason why I made that initial statement. On the second question that you asked about the role of transit agencies and transit itself, so we're going to start realizing that the traditional looking bus is going to change. And so the role of transit is, so it's more the definition of transit rather than what transit looks like. We now uh, we objectify transit by it physically looking like a bus or a, what we call a train and maybe that smaller bus. It's going to be the role, the definition of transit is moving a lot of people mm -hmm. from point A to point B often. Either it's going to be scheduled or on demand. It just depends. The propulsion of that vehicle and the way that it's driven is moot. It's going to be AV tech will take that over. So AV just becomes the, the, the delivery method of that, that service. So whether you ride by yourself or with another person or with 10 other people is irrelevant for AV tech. It's what is the form factor that's needed to meet that demand based on the, the location. So in a dense, tight, dense, compact area that has a street geometry of, of a certain kind, it's not going to make sense to have that large passenger vehicle for one person. Just as a physically not going to fit. Even if you have 10 million of them because everybody wants their own one, they're just not physically going to get in there. So you're going to have to have more people in more finite spaces. So right sizing the vehicle type for the trip type is what's going to be a huge opportunity and challenge for these network type approaches with these fleets. Yeah. And the role of transit agency will either be, they will either be uh, the person who basically develops the framework for this to work, they will license this, the technology to use in their fleets, or they will, sub they will basically partner with a Navy operator to service these, these corridors. Yeah. Yep. Question. Building off of that, what's to encourage someone to choose to use a vehicle that's a shared ride with 10 other people rather than riding by themselves? Is that through pricing strategies or sort of other types of incentives? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to density, street geometry, and time of day and use, and personal preferences and abilities. So that's the, the whole thing is going to start reorganizing itself. So you may have a preference saying that I'm only going to do shared rides because it's cheaper, you know? 
but some of my say, look, today I need to get it in my own right because I need to go through this thing. But if it's if everybody does that, as you know, you can't get to your destination. So having if you have high occupancy lanes in the urban fabric, not just in freeways, that's going to really encourage that movement. So it's whether you value time or space or um, price. Really, that's what that's. I mean, that's 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 true today as well. Okay, let's thank him. And uh, Tim's on the advisory board for ITS, which is meeting today, and will be at our big party tonight. So uh, on the roof, uh, on third floor, please come, and uh, we'll see you all uh, hopefully this evening. Thank you.